Today I'm going to be covering a very famous chess game played in the U.S. Chess Championship in 1964. And this game is played between Robert Eugene Byrne, who is uh, white in this game, and Robert James Fisher, who is black. And in this game, we're going to take a look at the wrong rook move. Often in chess, we have an open file, and we can move either rook to it, and uh, it is difficult to determine sometimes which rook move is best. So this video is going to cover how to determine that. Uh, Burn starts out with d4, and we see knight f6, c4, g6, g3, c6, after c6, bishop g2, d5. And uh, Fischer is playing the Fianchetto Grunfeld here. White continues with uh, c takes d5. And after pawn takes back, we see e3. After e3. No, not e3, not yet. After pawn takes back, uh, knight c3 was played by white. Good idea, just putting some pressure on d5. Then bishop out to g7, e3, castles, knight g e2, knight c6, white goes ahead and castles, and then we see this move b6. Now if we go ahead and we take a look at this position before the move b6, it looks fairly even, you know, it's pretty symmetrical. Both players have a knight on the third rank and castled on the king side with Fianchetto bishops. And essentially both sides have only uh, one minor piece left to develop. So you know, it's a pretty even position, pretty symmetrical. And a lot of people here would think, well, why not develop this bishop out this way? You know, if black plays b6 here, which he did in the actual game, it seems like it's just uh, losing a move because this bishop could already develop out this way. Well, the reason Fisher did not develop the bishop out to f5 is that it's going to lose a tempo and give white a huge amount of control over the center. Same thing with bishop g4. In either case, white will play f3 after moves such as queen to d7, then Byrne would have continued with e4 and gain the center, gaining a tempo on this bishop. And this bishop, uh, I guess it could go out to h3, but if it goes out to h3, white will simply take the bishop and went upon on d5. So therefore, maybe bishop out to e6, and then white just has a huge amount of spatial control, gaining several tempos on black's bishop, and black's uh, pieces are a little bit uh, discombobulated. They're not working very well together. So this would be really good for white. He could develop his bishop out here or maybe even out to e3 and just uh, continue to dominate the position. Therefore, Fisher does not play bishop out to f5 or even bishop out to g4 because of f3, e4. Therefore, we see b6 in the actual game. And uh, that is a good move. White goes ahead and responds by playing b3. Neither side has any notable weaknesses. Here black continues development with bishop out to a6. This is a good move. It does pin this knight to the rook and it gains a lot of space. After bishop to a6, bishop a3, then we see rook out to e8 preparing e7, e5. Uh, white goes ahead and continues his development with a queen out to d2. Now Fisher at this point had really calculated the move e5. e5 is a bit of a risk here. The reason being is that when white takes on e5, black is going to be left with this isolani on d5 and it could become very weak especially if the queens are traded off, or really not necessarily the queens, it's mainly the minor pieces. If uh, black could, uh, if white could trade off the minor pieces, 
then this pawn on d5 would become very weak. It would most likely be lost in the resulting endgame. So Fisher is taking a bit of a risk here, but it is a calculated risk. This uh, Isolan is going to make black's pieces very good, and e5 opening up the center is going to help activate its bishop on g7. So as we will see here, Fisher's uh, pieces will become extremely active. And that will compensate for the isolated pawn in the center. So after e5 is played, uh, let's see here. So e5, and then we see d takes e5, knight takes e5, and this bishop is now uh, able to control a ton of space once uh, these black knights are, are once they're moved. Here we see rook f to d1, and here, this is where we're going to look at the correct rook move. White uh, went ahead and played rook out f to d1 here. And my question to you is, is that the best rook move? White is wanting to hit this pawn on d5 and try to win it before black has a time to defend the pawn. Right now, white is not able to win it, even though he has three pieces attacking the pawn, and black only has two pieces, because this knight on e2 would hang. So, for instance, if knight takes d5, knight takes, bishop takes, it looks like that white has won the pawn, but in fact, white would lose a piece here after bishop takes e2. So, therefore, that is not playable. Let's go ahead and back up. Instead of that, White's idea here is to play this rook f to d1 so that uh, this pawn can be captured on the next move. So which rook in this position is better? Well, White's rook on a1 is defending a2, so it is serving a purpose, but a2 is not under any threat. It's not going to be attacked anytime soon. It's very difficult for black to attack the a2 pawn. Also, white has a knight and a queen defending a2. So this rook on a1 is therefore not performing any important functions. It looks uh, pretty lousy on a1 because it's defending a pawn that's already defended twice. So it's basically redundant. However, this rook on f1, it is also defending a pawn but the f2 pawn is very important to the safety of white's king. If the f2 pawn is somehow captured, white's king could become very exposed. So therefore, rook on f1 is performing an important function by helping defend the weakest point in white's king side and therefore defend white's king. So the rook on f1 is better than white's rook on a1. Therefore, this rook on a1 should be improved. In chess, uh, you should look to improve your weakest piece, your weakest link, and therefore you would greatly improve your position. This look on f1 is going to improve only slightly by moving to d1. However, the rook on a1 is going to improve greatly by moving to d1, so therefore white's overall position would improve even more. Th this was the correct rook move. In the actual game, white makes a huge mistake and plays rook f to d1, and this actually is uh, going to make White's position much more difficult to defend. And this move, plus a mistake, another slight mistake in a few moves, will give Black a huge advantage. So after Rook F to D1, we see uh, Knight takes. Let's see here, after Rook F to D1, uh, Knight to D3 is played. And this, again, is just highlighting the importance of the f2 pawn and just how weak it is. So knight d3. After knight d3, we see queen out to c2. Uh, the idea behind queen c2 is, well, white is afraid of knight e4 attacking f2. So therefore, the queen moves out of the way to better defend f2. Now, if knight e4, rook takes d3, bishop takes, a queen takes, and white has pretty much stopped black's attack, and is currently up a pawn, plus d5 is very weak, white would have a, a really good game here. So that is white's idea, 
uh, behind playing the queen out to d, queen out to c2. However, it doesn't work in this position because Fisher has a really great move. When uh, the queen moved out to c2, Fisher sacrificed the knight on f2 and drew white's king out. Uh, Black's attack is going to come very swiftly here and white it doesn't have a whole lot of time to defend against this. This bishop on g7 is going to play an important part in pinning down this knight to the rook on a1. Also this uh, knight takes f2 highlights the displacement of white's rook on d1. It should belong on f1. So in this actual position White would have been better off trying some move like knight to f4 so that queen could defend f2 and after move like knight e4 for instance just play bishop takes. Get rid of that a knight and here White's position is still very difficult to handle but at least he's not losing material right out and this knight could take on e3 or I mean on d3 and try to resolve some of this tension. So that would have been White's best chance. Instead, we do see Queen C2, Knight takes F2, and White must capture back. King takes F2. So after King takes F2, we see Knight G4 check, King G1, Knight takes E3. Black now has two pawns for the piece. Um, and after Knight takes E3, attacking the Queen, Rook, and Bishop, we see Queen out to D2. Uh, here knight takes on g2 is a stunning move. Uh, Fisher declines taking the rook. This bishop is way more important than the rook because it is a very important defender of white's king. And without the bishop, white's king is comes under this huge attack. So knight takes g2 is the correct move. King takes back. And now we see d4. So at this point, Fisher had two pawns for the piece. But now he sacrifices one of the pawns back in order to clear this diagonal right to white's king and to make attacking it much easier. White must capture the pawn on d4 or there's a piece. If uh, this knight were to move, then we would see rook takes e2 and white would lose material. So therefore knight takes d4 must be played. And after knight takes d4, bishop b7 check. White's king comes under attack. King f1 is tried. After king f1, queen d7. And here white goes ahead and resigns. Even though white is currently up by a minor piece, well, really uh, up by two pawns, his king is greatly exposed. Knight on d4 could be captured back. Uh, at some point, maybe uh, black could play this other rook and put pressure on the knight. And this bishop on a3 is out of the game, not participating in, in the defense. The rook on a1 is not participating in the game either. And the rook coming down this e-file cuts off white's king from escape. So therefore white went ahead and resigned here because the attack is winning. But let's go ahead and look at uh, why the attack is winning. So how does white defend here? Maybe white plays queen out to f2. It seems like a reasonable move. Just trying to help uh, bring the queen closer to the king. We would see then queen h3 check. King g1 is forced. Rook e1 check. This is just a removal of the defender of the d4 knight. If queen takes, then we have this check made. So queen takes is not good. Therefore, after rook takes e1, we would see bishop takes d4, and this is winning at least the queen. If the queen takes his checkmate, maybe knight e4 trying to defend, bishop takes, uh, king takes f2, queen takes, and white's attack, I mean, and black's attack continues. The white king is greatly exposed. At this moment, uh, basically white has a rook and knight versus the queen, and is down by two pawns in addition to that. So this is a really good attack. Let's go ahead and move back a little bit. Knight was here, bishop was here, rook here, queen was here, king moved out to f1. We have a queen on 
d2, not, not d3, d2, and after king f1, we see queen to d7. Let's look at some other possible ways to defend this. Well, what about knight to c2? Well, if knight to c2, then we would again see queen h3 check, king g1, and bishop takes on c3. It's sufficient to win. The queen can't take because of 